I get Good that. afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, webinar this afternoon. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of Foreign Policy Research Institute. And this afternoon we have with us Parag Khanna, who is the author of, a, in his new book, a Move the Forces Uprooting Us. Uh, to uh, moderate this discussion as part of our regular People, Politics, and Prose series, we have FBRI's Ron Granieri, who, as many of you know, is FBRI's Templeton Education fellow as well as the executive director of FBRI Center for the Study of America and the West. Uh, he's also an associate professor of history in the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College. Um, I'd also like to mention for those of you who are partners and trustees that we will be having an event on Thursday afternoon in our offices featuring uh, Joshua Krasna talking about post-American security complex in the Middle East. If you're not already a partner, now would be a good time to consider um, becoming one. Uh, thank you to all our supporters and uh, and members, we cannot do what we do without you. And we are indeed very, very grateful. Um, also a reminder to put your questions in the Q&A box uh, and go ahead and start inputting them because I know Ron likes to draw on them in the conversation. So without further ado, take it away, Ron. Thank you, Raleigh, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this latest episode of People, Politics, and Prose, FPRI's conversations with authors about their works, their careers, and the ideas that drive them. I am Ron Granary, and I have to issue my standard government-issued disclaimer that any opinions I may express are, of course, my own and not those of the Department of Defense, the U.S. Army War College, the United States Army, or anybody else you can think of except me. But all of us at FPRI, thank you for joining us on Zoom. It's a pleasure to have you with us. The map of humanity is not settled. With these words, Parag Khanna opens his newest book, Move, The Forces Uprooting Us, which details the forces pushing human beings to new places, socially, mentally, and physically. In urgent prose studded with anecdotes, Khanna traces how the combination of climate change, demography, and generational dislocations all serve to encourage and even reward those who are going to move with the times, to explore new regions, build new cities, reimagine work, and revolutionize long-held notions of citizenship and belonging. If the title of the book is in the imperative mood, however, much of the text is in the subjunctive. Although the discussion of the climate crisis and especially of geographic realities is solidly empirical, Kana's discussion of how life on earth might or should change in response to the forces he describes relies on assumptions about the reactions such massive changes will call forth. Young, wealthy, well-educated readers will perhaps eagerly embrace Kana's confident assumptions about migration, social change, and the future of urban life. If recent history is any guide, however, it's important to remember that the world includes many people who would greet such a future with fear and even anger. As easy it may be to see the logic on where he expects us to end up in some golden future, Kana's work raises serious questions about what is likely occur to occur between now and then. So how will societies respond to these forces uprooting us? How will societies and individuals regulate and manage their different responses? What will be the future of the state or of democracy? These are some of the questions we will address today in our conversation with Dr. Parag Khanna, who is the founder and managing partner of FutureMap, a data and scenario-based strategic advisory firm. Holder of a PhD from the London School of Economics, he is the internationally best-selling author of seven books, including not only Move, but also Connectography, The Future, and The Future is Asian. His work is based on travel to more than 150 countries, and we are delighted that he has decided to stop and visit with us today here on Zoom. Welcome, Parag Khanna. Arnold, thank you so much. Very uh, enticing introduction. Um, and I know we're going to have a great conversation today. Thanks to you and to Carol for, uh, for inviting me. You, you bet. So uh, you, you have a, uh, you know, seven books already. And so I'm curious how you see this book fitting in with your previous work. And if you had to come up with a, let's say, a word or phrase to describe what you do, what would you call it? 
Well, I travel, that's for sure. I travel, therefore I am, is my Cartesian kind of uh, adaptation of my, my worldview. If I didn't travel, I don't think I would do any of this because in many ways, going back to my very first book written in my 20s, I've you know, backpacked to 40, 50 countries uh, you know, in the manner of the great Robert Kaplan, who's always been a hero, role model, and mentor uh, of mine. Um, you know, it was about, or, or part of the thesis emerged from just juxtaposing what I saw in the academic literature and the policy literature versus what I saw on the ground. You know, and that is always exciting to an academic and a traveler to see that contrast. And I just saw it firsthand everywhere and I needed to just write it all down. You know, and obviously along the way, I was getting that, that same training that, that, that many of us have in terms of academic, going through the academic ropes and motions and certifications and so forth. But I needed to always contrast it with kind of, you know, being on the ground. So in terms of a common thread, that's one. That's a methodological thread, you might say, is taking seriously what I very way back then called the aesthetic methodology, you know, kind of catch all for, uh, you know, human anthropology and kind of being on the ground. I wanted a term for it to call the aesthetic method, you know, not just the academic method. And the two are, are equally important. So that's been a thread. But substantively, the common denominator would have to be geography, which obviously relates in many ways to travel itself. Uh, you know, I studied political geography. It's the terrain on which I'm most comfortable in this book. Uh, and all of my books are fundamentally about geopolitics and the transformation of power relations across space and time, uh, broadly understood. This book, Move, is about human geography. And I had not yet written a book about, you know, global demographics and the distribution of people around the world and how it's impacted by forces ranging from political upheaval to climate change. And human geography is not a subject that people in geopolitics have taken necessarily all that seriously. Even though, of course, going back to 19th century geopolitical methodologies and power calculations, demographics matter. People matter. Uh, the way I phrase it in the book is collecting people is collecting power. And it was ever thus, but it becomes that much more important in a world where the world population is actually beginning to decline, which is not something anyone in the 20th century had to worry about. Because in the 20th century, we quadrupled the size of the world population. There was an assumption that the world population was moving in, a, in literally an exponential fashion of growth and that we were heading into a Malthusian crisis. And yet here we are, a world where the population of the world is not yet at 8 billion people people and may never even reach 9 billion people, which is significantly lower than the forecasts that were made uh, as recently as the late 20th century and even into the early 21st century. So right. I wanted to tackle all of this, but from a geographical standpoint, one of the prequels to this book was called Connectography, as you mentioned, that was about the functional geography of infrastructure. And I wanted to basically say, well, if I wrote a book about all of the world's infrastructure and how that shapes geopolitics and geoeconomics, what about what we're going to do? We, like we, the people, <laughs> we, right. the 8 billion we, the people, people, what are right. we going to do with that yeah, we have, how is it going to affect where we physically live in the world? And yeah. that matters because demographics matter as, a, as an ingredient of geopolitics. And therefore, I wanted to tell that story. And that's really where MOVE came from. As a, In a way, all seven books are just one stream of consciousness where an editor cuts me off. <laughs> you know, after I write a thousand pages, they say, OK, dude, you're done. Save it for uh, the next time, one. Time to, you know, <laughs> yeah, save it for the next one. But there is actually a logical arc. And this is from page one onwards. I explicitly say this is a book about human geography. And I wanted the geography of us to be front and center rather than the maps. And as you know, I'm obsessed with maps and cartography. I wanted the maps to put humans, the pixels of humans front and center rather than just borders and rather than just infrastructure, which I'd already done in previous books. Right. Well, and this idea of the, the movement part, it is, it is a fascinating element because you talk about human geography and you say in the, in the broad scope of human history, you, near the end of the book, you do have this great map that shows how humanity has, has moved from where human beings first emerged and has spread throughout the world. And so the fact that we are continuing to move uh, makes a great deal of sense. And yet, when we think about the modern world with its emphasis on borders and citizenship and uh, both the, the legal and the practical and the political limitations on movement, um, to what extent do you see sort of these are, that there are these sort of natural forces that are going to push against politics? How do you see politics responding to that, to those natural 
if you, as you describe the natural forces? Great question. So I want to give first a historical answer and then a kind of contemporary answer. You know, historically, we often talk about, you know, a world of a growing number of borders. And indeed, that's the case, especially since in this era of decolonization, you know, mm -hmm. we've quadrupled the number of countries in the world over the course of the 20, particularly the late 20th century. And yet the age of nationalism, the 19th century, the age of borders and decolonization and, and nationalism that we find ourselves in today is coterminous with growing migration. Mm -hmm. We have had a quadrupling of the number of countries and borders in the world, and we have also had a massive expansion in the amount of migration. So intellectually, there seems to be a paradox, or we, we posit borders as being in opposition to migration, but nothing of the sort is actually true historically. In every one of the past centuries, the decimal point in terms of the number of migrants continues to shift to the right. Mm -hmm. You go back in the 19th century, tens of millions. In the 20th century, hundreds of millions. And in the 21st century, we may have more than a billion people migrating. We're certainly well on our way. And that completely coincides with the rise of borders and nations. Mm -hmm. So these are not necessarily forces in opposition at all. And there's very little historical evidence to the contrary. In this age of nations and borders is the age of mass migration. Mm -hmm. It was ever thus. So we have to first get this false paradox, false dichotomy out of our heads, because no such dichotomy the second answer is much more contemporary, which is that it really depends region by region. Just because the Trump administration may be sour migration, you know, for a particular period of time, it doesn't mean that America is a not still history's greatest winner from migration, which it is. And B, as we saw from our own census in the United States, that's been released incrementally over the course of August, September, October, and into this into the into the, this season, um, the numbers tell a very different picture, right? America still lets in at a minimum hundreds of thousands of people every single year, right under the Trump administration's nose, America became more diverse, more mixed race, more Latino, more children identifying as mixed race children all throughout the Trump administration. So you have to view migration and human geography and the move new patterns of human as a force that spans thousands of years and in which the specific immigration policies of any particular country are nothing but an insignificant blip. And I literally mean to say that at Ronald, when you and I get together 10 years from now, when we talk about the demographic of America, the composition of the United States society ethnographically, we will literally say Trump who? And it's not a political statement I'm making. It's an analytical statement because literally he will have had lit almost zero impact on the demographics of the United States, literally almost zero, mm -hmm. right? You could say the pandemic will have had a much bigger impact because of the baby bus. Can I just give you just one more oh, sure. anecdote? Go because ahead. I, I went to high school. Germany for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And at the time, in the early 1990s, there was this politician, Norbert Rutgen, right? He said, Kinder statt Inder, it was a very famous line in German politics, you know, have more children, don't import Indians, right? Have Germans study IT, don't import Indian software programmers. And I have this fictitious kind of like dialogue in my head where I put my arm around Norbert, and it's the year 1990. I say, hey, Norbert, guess what? 30 years from now, right, from the year 1990 to 2020, 30 years from now, Norbert, I want to tell you something. Germany is going to have about 4 million people from this former Soviet Union. It's going to have about 5 million people of Turkish ethnicity. You're going to have about 2 million plus. You're going to have a few hundred thousand Chinese, a few hundred thousand Indians, and a million Africans in your country. Now, poor Norbert, Norbert's going to have a heart attack on the spot in 1990 when you had that conversation with him, right? Welcome to Germany 2020. Welcome to Germany 2020. Mm -hmm. The country that we're having this conversation live just had an election. Where was the far right party? Nowhere to be seen. Left, le center left coalition, pro immigration, allowing people to apply for citizenship in three years, right? Mm -hmm. European countries synonymous with birthright citizenship law, country in Europe by far, basically saying, you can become a citizen in a few years. Just come in, learn German, don't be a criminal. That's all they're asking, right? And so again, country after country, it's what you hear in the rhetoric among the nationalists and populists versus the reality of human geography and demographics on the ground. 
are night and day. Right. The tide of human geography, the tide of human migration always prevails. Well, and, and that I think is, you know, the, you, you, make a very, you make a very convincing case for that in the book. And, and so the idea of, you know, when you get from 1990 to 2020, right, and you say 30 years, all of these things have changed, and they certainly have. Um, but of course, when you're, and, and there is a you know, long debate in historical study about, you know, is daily politics, is this just the foam on top of the water as opposed to the important deep waves that move through history? Um, but we don't live, un unfortunately, right, we don't live in those deep waves, in the sense people do live from day to day and they live from minute to minute. And how do we, you know, when we see that certainly between 1990 and 2020, whatever progress made in Germany or any place else, um, you know, that in between there were moments of tension, moments of anger, moments of violence, moments of fear, moments when people were a lot less optimistic than you are right now. How should we imagine the, the next 30 years? Um, what, what should the role of politics be? Because it is true. I mean, any president of the United States, that's like if 100 years from now, um, you know, right now, if you ask people, tell me about Benjamin Harrison. Or tell me about, uh, or, or tell me about Chester Arthur, right? People, you know, American presidents sometimes don't have much an impact on people, but but a hundred years from now, between now and then, basically, how should we imagine the response of politics in individual mm -hmm. states, in in regions, to these forces? Because one could argue that the very fact that they may appear to be unstoppable may actually provoke more violent reactions against them. Mm -hmm. No question. And I'm taking yeah. those violent reactions. I'm taking the Trumpism and the Brexit and even, you know, Putin type nationalism and even Japanese insularity culturally into account as I make these forecasts, because those those forces of resistance clearly aren't having much of an impact. Secondly, you can't generalize about the West, mm -hmm. right? Canada and Germany are, if I'm not mistaken, pillars of Westernization and That's clearly right. have very different immigration policies than, uh, than say Britain during Brexit. Thirdly, Again, Brexit and Trump proved to be just blips because after all, you have a Biden administration that's pro-immigration, wants to expand the H-1B visa quota, wants to normalize the status of millions, tens of millions of undocumented migrants. And Britain, it's easier to migrate to Britain today than before Brexit because they've learned their lesson from Brexit and COVID. They have a shortage of 100,000 truck drivers, a shortage of 50,000 doctors. You've got significant excess mortality as a result of these labor shortages. Um, mm -hmm. And so they've learned from the mistakes they've made and they've, they're correcting in the, in the right direction, as I call it. But this does not make me an optimist, just to be really, really clear, Ronald. Okay. I mean, this, I may be, I may be, maybe I elied between my analytical normative frames a sure. bit because I want to see certain things happen and I want to remind everyone that mass migration is part of who we are as nations and as societies and we've been better for it. And I'm not the first person by a long mile to point that out. Right. So if I slip into that, fine. But remember, this is a book of scenarios. It's a book of scenarios about how human geography will play out. And of the four scenarios in the book, three are dire and negative and awful, right? I only posit one positive scenario in this entire book, mm -hmm. just to be clear. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do advocate for it because I want to see the human species survive. So sue me, right? But three of the scenarios are really pretty bad, right? Mm -hmm. Regional fortresses, bad. New Middle Ages, bad. Barbarians at the gate, bad, right? And the, I, I spend time in this book fleshing out just how bad things are likely to get. Right. But then the fourth scenario, Northern Lights, is where I talk about what we could do better, mm -hmm. right, in terms of a gradual recirculation of the world population in a way that rejuvenates our demographics and achieves greater sustainability. Now, but to directly answer your question, I want to raise a point. If I were to re-subtitle this book, I would just call it The Global War for Young Talent. Because when you ask what's the, going to be right. the, the theme, the driving political theme of the next 30 years, it is the psychological inflection point that because our global demographics are flatlining and our northern hemispheric, our OECD societies are aging, we face fiscal disaster if we don't bring in young taxpayers, caregivers, homeowners, renters, um, and so on and so forth, right? That's just a depth. Back. Let's again go back to the geopolitics of collecting people as collecting power. So country by country, Canada, Germany, and other countries are just ahead of others psychologically realizing this. But you need young people. 
if you're not importing young people, you're losing young people, right? Because, or you're losing population, you're shrinking, literally. And we know this in America, let's be clear. You remember when, um, uh, when uh, one of Trump's former chiefs of staff had said that, you know, we're desperate for more people, uh, you know, and I quote him saying that in the book, and he says, America's GDP could shrink by a trillion dollars, mm-hmm. uh, leaving aside, he said this before COVID, but on the basis of just uh, demographics alone, if we don't heavily import people. So the big story of the next 30 years, um, uh, Ronald, is definitely not a continuation of populist nationalist politics shaping our policies. It's a one by one awakening to the fact that we need to engage in a war for young talent to to bring in young people to actually have um, to sustain our economic model such as it is. That's the big story of the next 30 years. That's a global story for sure. And it's also just a one, you know, sort of thing. It's like psychologically, once people realize that the world population is not going to be 15 billion people, that there's not an endless supply of them trying to trample us. I actually think you can have, I would, I would be, it would be too much of a stretch to call it a cosmopolitan awakening. I don't want to use such flowery, you know, hopeful utopian language per se, but I do believe that psychological change, whether you're talking about anti-slavery or, 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 you know, banning smoking, we do change, we do evolve psychologically. And one of the incremental revelations will be, oh my God, we're not even going to be 9 billion people on this planet. And we're all, a lot of people in the wrong places. Our country needs young people. How can we work this through? That's not a pipe dream because again, welcome to Canada. Welcome to Germany. It's right. already happened. It's already happening. Well, and, and the, the, the basic insight at the beginning of this conversation is something that I, I don't think is, is appropriately uh, understood, let's say. And that is the, the collapse of Malthusian panic models. Um, you know, that, that we are reaching the situation where uh, you have, uh, you know, th- that, because gosh, you and I, I mean, you're not much younger than I am. We both remember there was a time when we were, we were seeing these panic scenarios of a you know, 11 billion people on planet Earth, 13 billion people on planet Earth. We wouldn't be, you know, the planet would be unsustainable. Um, now, the good news is, right, maybe, you know, as you say, we barely get to eight, maybe we, maybe we get to nine billion people. So in that sense, that one panic is out. But the idea of whether the whether the planet is nonetheless going to be unsustainable, because right? you do talk a lot about the climate change, and this is what I'm struggling with here too, because the you know the idea that um, we it's not that we have too many people on Earth, we don't, we're just not very well sorted. But if the sorting is a is a a matter of people going from where they are to someplace better, that's great. But if it's people having to flee from large segments of the planet because the planet is unlivable. That's not so good because then you end up with you end up with too many people. You end up with a Malthusian nightmare in small places rather than across the entire planet. And I'm uh, you talk about the the climate issues in the book, and I I, I want to get into this the idea about what we can or should expect um, in the future with climate movement. I, there's a great on page 168. You have the picture of tomorrow's climate oases, and I have to mention this just because it uh, it made me smile. Is that one of the future oases is the Great Lakes region of the United States? Um, and as a, a as a as a re- resident of Western New York, growing up, the so-called Rust Belt, right? We always knew right. that it was coming back uh, to us someday when people realized that you're know, being near fresh water right. and <laughs> temperate climate, this is a good thing. Um, but the idea about how should we understand the, the the movement of people with regard to climate? How should we understand the interaction of climate change in these changes? And just one more thing to throw in, because it's a question that Lawrence Husey yeah. asked about technology, is should we what should we think about climate mitigation strategies? Right? Is does that matter, or should we should we just assume that mm-hmm. these are forces that are going to be pushing us no matter what? Great, great question. So there's a logical sequence in a way in answering them. The first is that climate mitigation is when we talk about, uh, you know, Manhattan projects for decarbonizing industries and greening supply chains. Yes, we need to do all of that and more. And COP26, if they're promising 100 billion for that, it should be a trillion. It should be $5 trillion. They might even extend it into geoengineering. We should do everything we can to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, promises that date to 2060 are not really helpful today, however, and that's really the realm that we're in politically. We're not making significant enough efforts. And a corollary to that is to remember that really climate, the climate is a complex system. It doesn't actually bounce back, even if you 
stopped all day. You don't suddenly clear all the skies. You don't suddenly reverse, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the sea levels rising. A place that has drought is not suddenly going to experience torrential rains. So we're already in a world where you need to be doing more climate adaptation. And let's be clear, I document this. And if you look at the composition of the drivers of migration for millions of people across the planet or politics and economics have vied for to be the top driver in the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. Already in this century, climate is boom, a much bigger piece of the pie in terms of the proportion of migration that that is been by these forces it rivals political and economic drivers and exceeds them in many regions of the world so we already live in a world where climate adaptation which is to say migration is happening and is necessary for our survival now again at a very fundamental level we are mammals right we have a fight or flight instinct we're not going to fight nature you're going to move away you're going to move from coastal to inland areas from low-lying the higher elevated areas from south to north. These are the three obvious, again, mammalian vectors of migration that are going to, that are occurring and will occur. So you can either, I don't want to say embrace it, but accept that it's a fact and it's moving in that direction. It already is. And you can redesign your infrastructures, your immigration policies, your spatial planning, your territorial allocation accordingly or you can just let it happen incrementally with people, you know, rafts sinking in the Mediterranean Sea and Greek and Italian, you know, uh, constabularies and coast guards shooting, machine gunning and killing migrants and, you know, similar kinds of things happening on the U.S.-Mexico border, though actually the Mediterranean is worse. Or you, you can say, wait a minute, you know, look, climate change is not going to, it's not just some kind of seasonal phenomenon. This is real. It's permanent. How are we going to redesign our, our space? So, you know, you actually asked me at the very beginning, what one phrase, you know, characterizes my work. I should have mentioned it then, but this is the appropriate place for it. I call it programmable geography, right? Programmable geography is the idea that, again, the term that I use and you also use misalignment or mm -hmm. resorting. Mm -hmm. We have a fundamental hour plan has several sets of layers of lines that we have built on top of it cartographically. We have the geography of resources, that's God-given. We have the geography of borders that we have built, the geography of infrastructure that we have built, and the geography of humanity, which is mobile. And we need to realign these four layers and no alien species is going to do it for us and no UN summit is going to do it for us. And Joe Biden isn't going to do it and Xi Jinping isn't going to do it. We need to rethink the realignment of these layers mm -hmm. and resort the geography of people, borders, infrastructure, and resources. That's the grand civilizational challenge here for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 years. And sovereignty alone isn't going to answer that question. So I'm advocating that we think about climate migration is a larger share of migration. Think about it, accept it as inevitable, you know, for better or worse, and rethink our spatial planning and program geography accordingly and say, hey, look, there's large parts of Russia that are habitable and there are no people. There's large parts of Canada that are habitable and there are no people. There are Eastern European countries where everyone has left, but they are verdant and fertile. I focus on Eastern Anatolia as a region that I've traveled through a lot at the border between Turkey and the Caucasus. And I say, hey, wait a minute, this is the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, the cradle of civilization. To the south, you have tens of millions, collectively hundreds of millions of Arabs and Persians who live in unlivable countries increasingly due to climate change. Are you really telling me with a straight face that as Turks abandon this perfectly livable region and there's just a flimsy barbed wire fence or even troops there that 10, 20, 30, 40, year, 40 years from now, that this geography is not going to be in Persians? I mean, of course it will. Of course it will. Right. Yeah. And so you just have to accept that and ask yourself, can you shape the way we govern that geography accordingly and provide incentives to Erdogan and his next 10 successors to think about how they might even benefit from rethinking what their demographics and spatial planning is. And that's what I'm pushing for. That's, and, and that's very interesting thing. I mean, we can we have a long talk about Turkey. You know, that is a, basically Erdogan's base, right? There is Eastern Anatolia and, and Central Anatolia and, and how that works politically. I want to bring in some of the questions from the 
audience. And there, there's there's a, a cluster of questions from Larry Holman, which I want to I want to compress into one that is that, that comes up very strongly through what he's talking about. And what what should we think about the role? You, you talk about our nature, our human nature as mammals, but what about what about our human nature, right? Our human failings, our greed, our fear, or, you know, the things that make us who we are. How do you imagine these pressures of these forces acting on the individual human level? I mean, I know that's a little unfair question because that's not what your book's about, but I am curious about because we imagine, you know, those those individual pinpoints of human beings as they're moving. How do you how do you see how do you see finding ways to communicate these? changes and their importance to people so that they can make it work. Uh oh, I think we may have lost our guest. We'll give we'll give Parag, Parag Khanna a chance to come back. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I you know, it's been a delightful conversation. And I know that, uh, that this is a technological glitch. But I know that uh, the man who is as busy as Parakhan is with international discussions of his books. Uh, and just to show you, right, the, the role of these large forces is he comes to us live from, at this recording, live from Singapore, something that is only possible thanks to all of these technological advances that are just fragile enough to remind us that they are somewhat miraculous when they do work. But uh, but I, I I do see uh, you know a, a lot of interesting questions here, and I do hope that we can get to some of them with uh, with Parag Khanna. I'm in I'm in I'm in contact with my with my colleagues to see what we can do about this. Here he comes. Hello. Hello, Parag. Welcome back. Hi. Oh <laughs> my God! I'm so you know my my hotel just had a my my hotel just had a Wi-Fi outage. So oh I reconnected on my phone. So sorry about that. I have no idea what happened, but fortunately I'm, right. I'm tethering, so we're okay. I'm, that's fantastic. I was I was just saying before you came back that this is a you know these technological advances that make this possible at all they are just fragile enough to remind <laughs> us how miraculous they are. I guess right. So when they when they don't work, but I'm glad you made it, it back. That's very very <laughs> elegantly put. <laughs> um, but it's uh, it's it's great to have you back, and, and we will uh, uh, we we can go on for a little bit longer hopefully. But the so the question of individual human nature. In, in the face of these changes, right? So le leaving aside big politics, but still thinking about it as the, le the lived experience of people, especially because you do talk about generational differences and how young people are viewing, view these potential changes versus the older generations. What do, you, what do you think about the role of, you know, the impact of all this on human nature or how individuals can be sort of educated, encouraged to embrace the opportunities uh, that are to come? I'm, I'm so glad that you raised this, and that you framed it in this way as well, because let's say human psychology, if not human nature, does change generationally, and it is changing more rapidly than most people appreciate. And I go into this at great length in the book for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you're going to write a book on the future of human geography, you have to look at the composition of the future of humanity the future either geography or future psychology without looking at today's young people. Mm -hmm. If I'm looking at the world of 2050, right, um, you know, I have to look at today's 10 year olds, 20 year olds and 30 year olds. Um, so this, this, this research took me into new terrain, which is kind of, you know, demographics and psychographics and surveys of young people and young people across the world horizontally subscribe to these, you know, values of connectivity, of mobility, of sustainability as very deeply part of their identity. And so, as I explained, you know, based upon all this survey data, young people around the world have more in common with each other 
than they do with their own uh, relatives, you know, in their own countries. So you do have this common generational identity of millennials, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, you know, our children, basically. And so I do think that they view the world differently than we do. You know, again, this is not a matter of opinion, quite frankly. This is this is the most psychoanalyzed generation in history because we look at their Facebook page, we search their Facebook pages, and we know what they think. And I'm not making up these terms. Connectivity is the term. Mobility is the term. Uh, sustainability is the term. These are their values. You say human values. These are the three human values of the 4.5 billion young people of the planet who represent more than half of the world population today and 100% of the world population tomorrow. And they will not necessarily become like us. That's another point I make in the book. If you think about generations as simply getting old and settling down and being pacified, like you know the 60s generation, well, there was a reason why that happened. A, global economic prosperity and, and expansion, uh, becoming homeowners and having children. Let's focus on those three. The world economy is no longer automatically growing and there isn't a guaranteed right to, you know, sort of to prosperity. Secondly, young people don't own homes. They own fewer and fewer young people own homes. And most of all, they're not having children. So why should you assume, why should anyone assume that young people are going to become like us if there's no economic growth, they don't own homes, they're not having children. Those fundamental material conditions are not met for a stable stabilization. And when we think about who is the median human being in the world, or certainly in the future, it's not a two household, two income, married, suburban family with two kids. The median person in this, in this future to in the present is a young, childless, urban financially struggling person in a, in a developing country's, you know, mega city. That's who the kind of median human being is today. And I'm writing about that person and in many ways for that person, because that is who humanity actually is. So it isn't actually us, right? Mm -hmm. It isn't stable. It isn't suburban. It isn't, you know, whatever in terms of family structure, all of that is changing. That reinforces these psychological conditions and these new youth values, if you will. So, and that, of course, intersects with climate change and migration policy and these other things because young people are saying, hey, I have a right to mobility. I don't want to be stuck in a place that's going to be completely sideswiped by climate change. And I have solidarity with my fellow young people around the world. So I embrace a greater de degree of migration, even if it requires a certain amount of accommodation uh, where I live in the country I'm from. Right. Well, and, and here's a question. This is good about the, the idea about when young people decide to move or when any population decides to move. You mentioned in the book, the, 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 the current and the potential future role of, of diasporic communities. And uh, Ben Pribitok asks this question, how should we imagine the development in the places that the people leave? Um, you know, that, that when we have a situation where if young people are moving, um, they're leaving areas where if they had stayed, they would eventually become the leaders. Um, how do we imagine the, the connections, sort of the trailing connections of these moving young populations? Well, it's very interesting. So there are countries where if the demographic foundation is eroding, then someone becoming part of the diaspora or brain drain is something of a zero sum proposition because you don't, you have a country that's in decline. And even as you give back, it's not enough to sustain the economy and you don't have a next generation growing into the labor force. So that describes much of the world actually. But in some Asian countries, places like India, you still have such a large human capital surplus that you can export people and you have more young people coming up. You know, So the Indian diaspora has a particular place in my book. I mean, I'm a member of it. So it was kind of funny to write about it as well at the same time and kind of analyze that I myself was born in India and, you know, only immigrated to the U.S. As a, as a kid. But, you know, India is an interesting case because it's so much younger than China that the Indian diaspora will become much larger than the Chinese diaspora in the next 10, 20 years and is much more globally distributed than the Chinese diaspora as well. Already, Indians represent a larger share of the OECD, of the foreign-born workforce of OECD countries, our countries, rich countries, than Chinese do by more than a million people. It's a huge gap. And the gap is going to grow significantly also because of geopolitics, because 
because we're suspicious of China and, and, you know, unfortunately also of Chinese people, whereas Indians, not at all. They're embraced everywhere. And they learn English and they assimilate. So there's huge disparities in how, you know, demographics and diaspora geopolitics will sort of play out in the years ahead. In terms of just you know speaking generically about outflow and inflow of countries, um, you know there is on the one hand that brain drain effect that a lot of people lament. On the other hand, you have more seamless global financial and remittance markets, and you even have cryptocurrencies enabling this. So you're able to directly support you know economies, societies, infrastructure, social infrastructure in countries of origin than ever before. So I can't say that there's one answer to how this will play out. I can say that when Brazilians leave Brazil, it's not good for Brazil, right? Mm -hmm, you know, right. Um, but when Indians leave India, it's still good for India. And that's, you know, obviously two very, two very large diasporas, but two very different outcomes in terms of how this is playing out right now. Sure. Well, and, and Greg Bloomquist asks a pair of questions that, uh, that fit in with each other. One is the idea is, should we be, uh, you know, we take for granted, right, that, that population growth is is slowing down significantly in, let's say, the, the North um, and in the old industrialized world. Um, should this be a question of concern or analysis? Do we, um, it, or is this sort of the inevitable product of uh, a modernizing, urbanizing society? This is what comes when, when both men and women are educated and people can make choices about family size and family sizes shrink. Um, if that's so, right, do we imagine then that these young people, when they move from other parts of the world to this industrialized West, or what we used to call the industrialized West, um, that they will they will come, they will end up essentially embracing those same values, and so so the 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 North is where the populations go to move and then to die out because they don't reproduce themselves. That's, that's a bit. So I, I phrase that, that a little direly, but yeah, yeah. good. <laughs> There's, there's, there, there's a lot of concern that obviously when foreign population, let's, let's take Europe as an example, you know, we, we know, by the way, and again, our latest census really bore this out in striking terms. It's incredibly powerful and worth reinforcing. When Latinos come to America, they become more American than Americans, quote unquote, right? You look at the patriotism. We have to celebrate this. We just have to pause for a moment and celebrate this. When Indians and when Latinos come to America, they are so patriotic. They absolutely assimilate. And this is a beautiful, magnificent thing about America. Now, in Europe, there is a concern that, you know, they bring their values and this sort of thing. The truth is, and we have very clear data around this, um, that actually birth rates decline, adherence to religion declines, all of these things. So in Europe, too, Turks become like Europeans, Africans, Arabs, they become like Europeans, they assimilate by and large. Uh, so we, we, we focus on these fringe, outlying, you know, rebellious, isolated communities, balkanized, and violent and so on. But come on, that is a really fractional, the marginal, marginal story in the grand scheme of things. Does a lot more social investment have to go, whether it's Sweden or Germany or France, into assimilation policies and social integration and language training and equality? Yes, absolutely. That is part of our new social democratic economic model. That's what we should spend on to optimize the human capital in our society, including immigrants, which are a growing share of the population. So yes, we can deal with those things because there's actually tried and true ways of doing them, like language adoption, like skills training, like social integration. So put money into those things and those things will happen. They've always happened. And the successful European countries are the ones that do those things. So I don't worry about uh, them not becoming like us because mm. hundreds of years of mass migration prove that they do become like us. We just have to continue to invest more in it as the numbers grow. So I, this is an area where you can legitimately be an optimist. And also because again, it's economically necessary necessary to bring in those those migrants because really if you don't you face the the the, the catastrophic you know population uh free fall that many european countries are experiencing and basically you'd much rather have you know too many people than too few as right. a lot of countries are learning sure well then and we I'm, I'm glancing at the clock, speaking of too many and too few, as I know that you have an, another appointment coming up. I want to I want to squeeze in a couple more <laughs> questions, uh, just a, just a couple. Um, sure, and that is one is Jerry Rubenstein asked a question about pandemics. 
And um, I, this is a fascinating question about, you know, what we've seen happen with the pandemic in the last two years. How do we see, do we see this as driving more movement or um, how will pandemics and especially the, the way, the, their differential impacts, how will they affect the movement of populations? Well, it's, it's so interesting because the pandemic brought about this so-called great lockdown and great mm -hmm. reset and people have, you know, pretended or kind of always, we always make this error of linear extrapolation, sort of like, oh, well, if, you know, migration had reached a high point in 2019, then it all stopped and now we're going to be in an era of low migration because of the pandemic. Well, obviously not at all true, right? Um, in fact, the trend that we've been on over centuries and centuries, let alone decades in the last few years, is of ever increasing you know, mobility of people and the, my, and the pandemic, once it ends, is going to lead to a number of changes. First of all, a lot of people will be saying, well, where do I want to spend a future pandemic? It's probably not trapped in a tiny cubicle, you know, studio apartment somewhere. Um, now I can take advantage of, first of all, I don't want to live in a red zone. I don't want to live in a country who handled the pandemic so badly that their passport has been devalued. So I'm going to try and move at the first opportunity I can. Secondly, I might take advantage of one of these nomad visa programs. Before the pandemic, there were two countries that were offering nomad visas, and now there are 75 countries offering nomad visas. Go and to live in that country and migrate to that country. So there's that to take advantage of. And then um, there's the technology. And I talk about this a little bit in the book and more in some recent articles, but we've learned how, in a way, how, how poorly structured our migration system is. But now that we have these QR codes for our vaccine certification, you can have QR codes for other things like your educational history, your criminal record and other kinds of things. And we can start to move in a direction of digitizing rather than over bureaucratizing mobility. So I think coming out of this pandemic, a number of things about how we organize global mobility will be different different and they will be more fit for purpose given the demand for labor movement and the, the pressures of climate change in the years ahead. So I'm actually pretty optimistic about this because pandemics do lead to these orthogonal kinds of shifts and one of them is absolutely going to be the digitization of migration. Right. Well, and, and well, this then leads to, a, I, I'll say it will have to be one of our final questions there. There's a bunch of questions from the audience that we could get into in great detail. I hope people will, will read your book and I, I hope that, uh, that maybe we can have another conversation about this. But I wanted to, what you just talked about with digitization, and, and, um, and this is something goes back to the, when you talked about in the book about young people and about their attitudes towards democracy. But what is quite shocking is in a world where people are counting on the ability to move, when you ask young people whether democracy is important, they say no. And um, a world that relies heavily on technocratic solutions to citizenship or to mobility and the same thing you talk about everybody having a QR code, that sounds okay if we're talking about a world where people's individual freedoms are preserved in a democracy or where, where participation in politics is possible. It doesn't sound so okay if I imagine a world where um, you have powerful technocratic states that are telling people that um, democracy doesn't matter. And this, this is what I, I think this is at the, at the root of a lot of questions people are asking and that we're all wondering about is, if we're all rootless and moving, right. are we invested in actually making our communities work? And if we're not, who's gonna run those communities? I'll leave that to freedom. Mm -hmm. the big these, are, these are, these are, yeah, I think these are wonderful questions and I love the way that they all do tie together and intersect. So a couple of things, you know, we don't really live in a world where the whole map is populated by strong, you know, authoritarian states, right? I know that the, the Biden Democracy Summit it gives the impression that there's a great civilizational struggle at play. The truth is that we have a very wide spectrum of regimes in the world that range from the kind of New Zealand and Canada style parliamentary democracies that are sterling in their transparency and you know civic participation, and then lots of countries in between. And we're sadly in that in between cluster right now. Um, and then full on, you know, vertically integrated authoritarian states like China. And the world is going to have that wide 
wide range of regimes. But here's where I'm putting my faith. As young people move and are mobile, they, they're not rootless. They try to establish roots. They actually try to become part of and have a voice in the societies where they live. And if they don't get that voice, then they'll probably leave by and they'll vote with their feet and punish those countries for not giving them a voice. So I actually put my faith, this is in a way a continuation of the previous question about young people and young psychology. Young people don't actually want to just take everything lying down, not even in China, for anyone who knows anything about, about China, right? In fact, you know, yes, young people have to be extremely cautious and self-censor and, and submit themselves to censorship in that country. But that doesn't mean that they don't find ways of expressing themselves and the government is not responding to what is clearly their sentiments. If you look at the lie flat generation and the people who are so angry about inequality in the educational system and in outcomes and in kind of, you know, being overqualified and under underemployed in the country, the government is responding to those demands. And so as young people move, they bring their values and their politics with them, and they're going to be demanding accountability everywhere. And this is the most, I want to end on a positive note. I put my faith in young people's demands for accountability and responsive government. And you see that everywhere. Look at everything from Occupy Wall Street, all every European movement, every week there's a new European protest movement. This is in a way a terrible thing. It shows the underperformance of governments and the lack of faith in democracy that does animate and is re re reflected in these surveys that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But it shows that they're not giving up. Right. They absolutely demand responsive government. Now, whether that responsive government of the future looks like Canada or Germany or Denmark or New Zealand or America or whatever the case may be, whether it's messy, it is going to have to be responsive government. Right. So you can put it where you want to on the spectrum of, you know, Western style liberal democracy or you know, technocratic you know, rule in this in the based upon the desire to preserve law and order. Put it where you want to. On that spectrum. But I absolutely believe that cit citizen demands, civic demands from citizens and non-citizens alike, from natives and from migrants, are very, a hugely powerful pressure. And remember that to put it, to bring it all back to the demographics, in a zero-sum demographic world, countries don't want to lose people. They will change their policies to attract and retain young people. And this is not a hypothesis. If you look at Poland right now, on the one hand, it's a country that's veering off to the right. On the other hand, it's a country that is actually slashed and, and, and reduced to zero all taxes on millennials because they're so afraid of brain drain. So right. take those two facts. And that dichotomy within one country is a really interesting example of where the future is. It's saying, don't alienate your young people. You alienate your young people, you destroy your future. And better governance will emerge at the, as a result of that single realization, which is why, I guess, you know, to finish where we started, it's why human geography is so important and why collecting people is collecting power. Well, Parakana, thank you so much. I mean, lots to think about, right? Uh, lots, uh, I'm sure I, there's lots more questions that we can't get, get to here, but I hope that that our listeners and our viewers have had a chance to, uh, to interact with your ideas, to think about them, that they will consider checking out MOVE, the forces uprooting us. Um, I thank Parakana for joining us today on People, Politics, and Prose. Thanks so much for being here today, Parag. We'll let you go to your next event while I, uh, while I say goodbye to our listeners. But thank you, Parag. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you so much. It's a great conversation. You bet. Bye-bye. You bet. Bye-bye. And thanks to all of you for listening in, for watching this. If you enjoyed this conversation, I hope that you will tell a friend that you will bring a friend next time. If you've uh, never attended an FPRI event before, I hope now that you see the kinds of things that we do, the kinds of challenging ideas that we want to present to you. Um, we hope that you'll consider supporting this work in the future, that you'll become a member and partner of FPRI. Um, to, if, to find out more about our programs, People, Politics, and Prose, and elsewhere, please visit Visit our website, fpri.org. Follow us on Facebook or on Twitter. Uh, you can follow the host of this program on Twitter, at Ronald Granary. But uh, we look forward to viewing, uh, having you all with us again sometime. But until next time, for all of us at FPRI who make these programs possible, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>